First of all, thanks very much for providing uh, this opportunity for me to, uh, to uh, exchange ideas on the global governance with uh, all the colleagues here. Uh, I was actually going to say that uh, um, given that Vice President Xi, uh, who is also an alumni of Tsinghua University, is in town, I, said, I could, could have said that uh, whatever the issues I can't address, I can't respond, we can leave to Vice President Xi. Uh, unfortunately, I just learned that he left it about an hour ago or something. So my situation might be the reverse. So uh, that's the unfortunate side about it. Uh, I, I, I think I communicated with Cassie about the, um, uh, you know, what's going to be the focus. I think that um, the topic is going to be on the uh, uh, global governance issue and the, particularly on the uh, on the issue of uh, G20, and uh, uh, but I was going to start, uh, 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 but I'm going to start with China, and to see because I think uh, uh, there's a lot of discussion about uh, you know uh, what should be the new forms of uh, uh, global governance, uh, but and, and China has taken a certain position on that, and uh, I so I have to first confess that I'm not a decision maker in any of those uh, decisions, but I think uh, as somebody who's done public policy issue uh, work in China. Uh, I have certain views on, on why you know, China has taken that position. So I, I will start with you know, uh, the situation in China and then move on towards to, to see what are the determinants uh, in terms of uh, China's role in, in, in that system and also how China views those issues. And then finally give my own thoughts about uh, uh, you know, the, the a particular uh, form of uh, global uh, mechanism, the G20 and to see how uh, that can, uh, uh, can become a very effective uh, uh, system for, for the uh, economic, uh, global, uh, economic governance. Uh, first of all, I want to give some sort of general background about what's happening in China over the last 30 years. I think the, uh, the basically China has gone through some major transformations. Uh, I summarize that into four major ones, and the uh, economic system reform, industrial structure, society, and the governance. Let me go through that. Uh, first of all, I think the economic system, China has been making major transition from a, a central planning system to a market-based system. So the outcome of that uh, is the, uh, the sustained uh, uh, rapid uh, economic growth. Uh, the red bar is the absolute number of GDP, and the, the blue line is the growth rate, uh, averaged about 10% over the last 30 years. The second major uh, transition is industrial uh, uh, structure. Uh, China has, over the last 30 years, uh, become sort of the global manufacturing hub. Uh, but the surprising part, if you look at this, is if you look, look at GDP, uh, the, in, before the reform, just at the beginning of the reform, uh, agriculture uh, as percentage of GDP is about 30 percent, but now it's hovering around 10 percent. Service picked up uh, in, in, in the 1980, uh, it's 21 percent, now it's just a bit about forty uh, percent. Uh, Surprisingly, manufacturing stayed more or less the same. It's about uh, you know half of China's GDP. And that explains why. Because I think if you look at any other countries, which have gone through this uh, in, uh, you know sort of development uh, uh, period, usually the manufacturing as percentage of GDP would decline. Uh, you know, for uh, I've looked at some countries of uh, similar per capita GDP. Usually, the uh, manufacturing uh, would be 40 or 30 percent of the, its uh, total GDP, but in China, it's, it's 40 percent. And of course, the, the key issue here is more of labor. As you can see, that um, the uh, the uh, uh, labor uh, 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 percentage of in agriculture in 1980s uh, are close to 70 percent, and now it's close to 40 percent. So there's a lot of trend, uh, sort of migrants, uh, migrant labors, uh, moving from uh, from a rural. Uh, to urban areas in, in manufacturing and in service. And the third major transformation is Chinese, uh, China has been transforming from a sort of largely rural and closed society to one increasingly urban and open society. And the rural population, uh, urban population, has, um, in 1980s about 20%. And now the most recent data is um, uh, 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 just a bit over uh, uh, 50%. So uh, more than, uh, this is the first time in China that uh, more than half of the population lives in an uh, uh, urban area. And also in, ter in terms of international linkage, I, I won't have to go through the details, but the one uh, number I think in terms of uh, Chinese nationals going overseas 
In the year 2000, it's just a bit over 10 million. And now um, in 2010, it's over uh, uh, 57 million. So many folks have increased. So you won't be surprised if you see increasingly more tourists in, in Dublin and in other areas in, in, in Ireland. And, and the fourth major transformation is governance structure. And um, as somebody who studies the public administration, I see from the inside there are, actually there are many uh, major uh, changes in, in China's governance structure. Uh, village elections started in 1992 and has been uh, increasingly uh, uh, moving uh, smoothly. And uh, also China has gone through uh, six major administrative and legal system reforms and also increasingly their uh, public uh, participation in the in public policy process has been increasing. So there are many uh, uh, changes uh, inside the system. So those are the, sort of in a way, the, the four major transforma transformations uh, going, going on in, in China over the last uh, 30 years. If you put any one of those transformations uh, in, you know, so in the last 30 years, be, that'd be fine. But I think in China's uh, situation is that um, uh, all of those four major transformations are happening at the same time in a country of, uh, of uh, over one billion people. So if you look at, you know, uh, uh, in, in terms of history, uh, that's really sort of unprecedented, uh, unprecedented uh, uh, in terms of the scale and t in terms of the speed of the, the change. Now, I think with that as a background, let me look at what are the determinants of China's role in global governance system. Um, uh, China's, uh, uh, in terms of China's role in global governance system, there are some, uh, my, this is sort of some of the principles I observed that um, uh, uh, China has been uh, uh, following. Uh, first of all, I think that China uh, has been uh, following quite stable principles uh, based on China's own diplomatic experience since 1949. And uh, this is sort of the equal treatment, respect for sovereignty, non-interference, mutual benefits, and co-development. And also, I mean, it sounds like rhetoric, but in fact, if you look at the behaviors indeed, I think that has been the, the principle that China has to try to follow. The second aspect is that China has uh, a huge respect for official, regional, and global mechanisms. And so in a way that um, uh, you can, uh, you know, for example, the, the UN system, and the, uh, the ASEAN, and, or, or, you know, the EU, and so on, so any, uh, issue, uh, any issues that, you know, dealing with regional issues and uh, China always try to respect to the, um, uh, 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 you know, to, to uh, this uh, sort of uh, more official mechanism. Uh, of course, I think there's also downside of that. I think China may have not, uh, 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 in a way, uh, uh, made the sort of good linkage with global, so non-governmental uh, uh, non uh, mechanisms. Uh, the third one is uh, not to lead in major international initiatives. Uh, I think this is, uh, you know, something that, uh, uh, in contrast to the 1960s and 70s, when, when you know, Chairman Mao was uh, uh, really, I think, uh, making some major uh, uh, initiatives in, in terms of uh, 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 his um, uh, proposals. But, but this was proposed in Deng Xiaoping, by Deng Xiaoping in the, in the 1980s, uh, and it has been pretty much followed by all subsequent leaders. And uh, basically, you know, China has uh, a huge country to run, and, uh, and also China has uh, a huge agenda in terms of its, uh, reform and development. So basically, China's uh, 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 international posture has been to try to uh, uh, focus on domestic reforms and build friendly relationship with, you know, uh, whoever uh, possible. So that has been sort of the basic principles underlying China's sort of international uh, posture. And also, I think China has a huge agenda uh, in terms of domestic uh, issues. I think it's how recently there have been talks about uh, you know, China's uh, 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 international emergency and so on. But in insight from you know, Chinese leadership, I think there's always been, uh, 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 you know, China has been, um, uh, uh, always been concerned with you know, those unfinished issues that China has been, had to, to follow. So I, I, I sort of put them into three categories. Um, uh, the first one, I call them fundamentals. The second is the mega trend, and the third are the key reforms. The fundamentals, uh, of course, is first the national integrity. Uh, this particularly relates to the Taiwan issue and the social stability. Again, you know, with 
all those major transformations I, I, you can imagine, uh, all the, uh, uh, the uh, conflicts and the, the uh, dilemmas and so on. So, and that has always been a major concern of the government. And also maintaining economic growth. Um, again, uh, every year China has to you know, provide something like uh, seven or eight million jobs for the new uh, labor sets uh, on the market. And also I think there's two other, uh, other uh, fundamentals, demographic uh, issues and also natural environment and resources I think are the also emerging to become uh, key fundamentals. Uh, now the second set of issues are the mega trends. Uh, the first one is urbanization. I think that uh, China is now going through that very rapid transition uh, to urbanize. And so I think that every year now about 1% of the Chinese population are moving into, into urban areas. And so in fact, I think that the rural and urban divide is, is increasingly uh, becoming a major issue. And for the people, how do you provide the same rights and, uh, you know, to the people who move from the, the, uh, the rural area? And that's a major challenge for, uh, uh, for government officials in at all levels. And, and also, of course, the, 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 what are sort of the, the system to, uh, for orderly flow of people and various production factors. Here, in particular, is the, the land. Land has been a, a, a major issue uh, in, in this process. And also, how do you create a sustainable urban governance uh, uh, system? For example, the public finance system. I think many people say that people who are moving from migrant people from, from rural to urban, then you should provide the equal education. Uh, uh, you know, for the, for the migrant uh, children. I think that's absolutely right. But uh, however, for the local uh, 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 government, uh, they are always saying that we don't have a, you know, in a way, sustainable uh, public finance system to, to pay for it. So how do you do that? So it's also some of the uh, uh, challenges related to urbanization. And, and the second issue is the welfare uh, system. Uh, China um, needs to build a comprehensive social security system in terms of pension, health insurance, low income, social security, and housing, and so on. So those are the things, again, uh, you know, this, uh, China has been making the transition from one that in the, in the, in the uh, central planning system, you know, I think this is not a problem. But over the last 30 years, in the reform into the market-based system, many of this were pretty much abandoned, left to the market. And now I think there is an uh, increasing outcry that, uh, you know, there's a need to rebuild the system. And, and, but, but it's no longer based on the central planning system, but on, on the market-based principles. So how do you do that? I think that's also a major challenge. And, and the next one is globalization. I think China has, of course, over the last uh, 30 years, have benefited a great deal from uh, foreign uh, investment uh, and trade. And also now, increasingly, there are also outflow of uh, uh, China's investment. Uh, and uh, I heard that Vice President Xi brought 150 plus members with him <laughs> on trade and uh, investment. So I think that that's of course now so it's becoming uh, both ways. And of course, uh, so the, you know, in a way people flow also it's both ways. And also energy, food and water security issues, value cultural traditions and public communications, uh, all of those are related to the uh, issues of globalization. I think that um, often that you see that in the media, I think the China has always been, uh, you know, uh, uh, in a way, uh, uh, it's been viewed as certainly as, as sort of the some, some sort, in a way, I think, let me put nicely, sort of outliers. So, but, but in reality, if you look at the, the issues, the challenges that China is facing, it's very similar to the ones that are faced by other developing countries. So those are some of the, the, the major, uh, I would call sort of mega trend. And, uh, Inside China, there are also some key reforms that are still unfinished. And uh, there has been a lot of discussion on it, but I think the moving forward has been increasingly difficult. And uh, first of all, I think there are some unfinished agenda of, of the structural uh, economic reform. Uh, how do you really uh, uh, you know, uh, foster an open and fair market environment, the balance between uh, state and, uh, and the private sector? How do you develop an uh, sort of effective economic re regulation of the uh, natural monopolies? And also on the social regulation system, uh, you know, in terms of food safety and other things. So those are the things that China still have to work hard on. And also there, is, uh, there are some sectoral reforms that have started, uh, you know, years ago, but still uh, moving quite slow. 
For example, the upgrade manufacturing. Uh, China has to really move uh, uh, the manufacturing uh, sector from one that's dependent on the, uh, 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 you know, sort of a lot of the raw material inputs and a lot of the environmental pollutions to one that's increasingly based on, on knowledge and, and, and service. And also uh, China's financial system reform and also in terms of the service economy development uh, and many other uh, issues that, that, uh, that have started uh, but still uh, uh, far from uh, complete. And the third is related to the governance system reform. And here again, that um, how do you really sort of restructure the governing institutions? And how do you sort of re, uh, you know, uh, to, to make sure the constellation of legislation, legal, uh, and uh, administrative system that's really in, in the right uh, balance? And also the relationship between central and the local uh, government, and also reform on the, in, in the civil service uh, system and the corruption systems and public participation in the public policy process. So all of those are the key issues that really yet to be uh, put in place. So those are some of the, the major uh, agenda that China has to, to, to work on. So I think because of all of those, so I think China's position on global governance issues is that China will continue to respect the existing global governance mechanism and actually uh, particip participating in it. Uh, also, I think China will join other countries in, in efforts in trying to reform the current system so that embedded bias and other deficiencies can be addressed. And third, uh, that China will join other countries in new global initiatives that help to address new uh, global challenges. So I think those are sort of the basic uh, 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 the positions that China will follow in, in, on, the, on the issue of uh, global governance. Now let's look at the uh, G20. Um, here I, I think that, um, uh, first of all, I think that the, uh, 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 the current global economic difficulties are, are quite complex and uh, multifaceted. And I think that uh, at all levels you can find you know, uh, people or institutions to blame. And uh, uh, so I, I think that that's sort of the fact. So the solution uh, would also have to be uh, uh, at all levels. And, uh, and uh, I think I'm sure that a lot of the discussions about the efforts to uh, reform the ex existing uh, mechanisms. Uh, at the same time that I think that there are also emerging new global uh, mechanisms trying to, uh, you know, in, in some have, you know, some have advocated that to replace the existing ones. But I think in, in, in my view that probably they should really try to complement the exi existing ones. And uh, the G20 is such, uh, 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 such a, a, a mechanism. I think G20 has done a great job uh, in, in terms of the uh, particular updates, the, the, the 2008 uh, global financial crisis. Uh, however, I think uh, how to make the transition of it from a crisis management committee to a global steering committee, uh, I think there are still fundamental challenges. Uh, and uh, so uh, I've, uh, um, uh, here are some of the ones that uh, I listed. And the first issue is the geometry of the G20 mechanism. I think the real issue is really sort of the legitimacy issue. Uh, I think uh, uh, you know, I was fortunate to, uh, to be involved in this issue actually before its existence. So I think there's a lot of discussion about the, the so-called geometry of the, the, the um, such uh, mechanism. Uh, should you have a fixed number of countries? And then you, you uh, always, always end up uh, you know, having discussion about why X should be in and uh, uh, you know, X, Y should be in, uh, but not the uh, Z and so on. So I think that, you know, we have a fixed number of countries, that, that's always an issue. And also another discussion is maybe there should be sort of changing membership depending on the issues. Maybe on global financial issues, there should be one group. On uh, climate change, there will be another. Uh, again, so that's, that's another, uh, you know, also uh, uh, a set of problems that, that also uh, would emerge. So I think that that's probably the first issue that needs to be addressed. The second issue is how to institutionalize G20 in the long run. I think I see there's a contrast. I think there's a sort of dilemma in, uh, in how uh, G G20 can, can move forward. Uh, on the one hand, on the one end, you can see G20 as a forum uh, for consultation and coordination. Uh, here, if that's the case, of course, then you'd have to 
think of that as sort of competing with existing regional and, and global governance forums, uh, such as APAC and many other uh, such uh, mechanisms. And also, of course, there are many uh, semi-official and non-governmental meetings, such as World Economic Forum and so on. So I think that's the uh, you know, dilemma that you have to compete with those. And the really, uh, if G20 want to have a you know, standing in, in those in areas of, uh, of uh, forums, then G20 have to become a unique platform that can inspire and innovate. Uh, that really requires informality and spontaneity. So that's on the one, one end. However, uh, if you really want G20 to become an important decision-making mechanism as well, then that really requires a whole different set of organizational uh, process. Uh, it really should really require that uh, you, know, you have a, a formal process, you have authorities and the institutions to really implement. So uh, should you have a stable secretariat, uh, you know, then you have to have a location to house it. Leadership and staff members, decision processes, and so on. So that whole set of things that you would have to, to come, you, another bureaucracy would have to be created. Uh, so in a way, such requirement would be opposite to the ones that we are talking about. Uh, the, the spontaneity, the informality, and so on, all gone. You have to, 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 uh, uh, to follow the, the uh, bureaucratic rules. The third issue is the agenda setting. Um, uh, I've, uh, I was, uh, I've been sort of involved in some discussions before the G20 uh, meetings. I can always see that um, uh, you know, there are, uh, you know, this urgency or there's a need for the G20 to produce some sort of tangible outcome to show that this is a useful mechanism. Uh, and so every hosting country will always try to, to do that. Uh, but at the same time that um, if you really want to turn G20 to be a sort of global steering committee, uh, so uh, then you should, instead of sort of you know, like a, you know, firing uh, fighters, I mean, then you have to try to identify long-term risks and try to address them ahead of the time. However, I think that uh, often uh, that takes a long time and takes many efforts that the benefits would not necessarily come to in the short term and not necessarily come to the, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the right uh, uh, moment when politicians need to, to have uh, political credits. So I think uh, whatever the system, no, no matter whether in China or in other countries, uh, I think it's very hard for people to invest their political capital for something that will benefit uh, uh, later generations. The last one is how to engage with stakeholders of various kinds who are not in the membership but have a legitimate right to have, the, have their voice heard. And again, here you have a sort of really operational issue that how to make the process manageable uh, versus how to make the process acceptable. Uh, so again, uh, I think the, the, the challenges are also huge. Um, I think that uh, for the people uh, who were involved in, in sort of, you know, climate uh, policy uh, debates in, in, in various, uh, you know, uh, uh, locations and people have always, you know, complained about the process. So anyway, so those are some of the issues that I feel that uh, need to be addressed before uh, 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 you know, so the G20 can be a real uh, effective uh, mechanism for global economic governance. And I think that the one thing that, uh, at the sort of last comment, uh, I think all of those discussions are often discussed among economists, and I'm sure many people here are economists. And, uh, and, but at the same time, uh, as a non-economist, I would say that uh, also people in public administration should also be involved in, in this. And that's sort of the purpose of my involvement in this discussion. Okay, let me stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you.